We started this series two years ago on Easter Sunday, Acts chapter one, when God starts a church. And we started that on Easter Sunday two years ago. And I, I've got a lot of thoughts about this book, but my hope is that studying through the book of Acts has been a blessing to you. Hopefully it's been challenging for you as you grow in your walk with God and your faith. Again, some of you have only been a part of our church during this series, but looking ahead, I'm excited about some other things that we've got planned. We're gonna spend four years in Matthew and 19 years in Leviticus. That's coming, so just roll with us. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna go, we're gonna go proverb by proverb through the book of Proverbs, which will take us until Jesus returns and then some. So... Honestly, read your Bible and do what it says, but, but like we love the Bible here. We, we preach from the word of God and on, preaching, honestly, preaching on a historical narrative, like this is tough preaching. And there's some passages, some of y'all looked at me like, I don't know how you pulled a sermon out of that. You know, it's tough, but we made it, everybody. Last Sunday, I preached the last text in Acts 28, and today, I really want us to look at some big picture thoughts from this great book of the Bible, and I want us to see specifically how God has moved through this book And I want us to end by asking, Lord, would you move in the same way through us? How many of you know the same Holy Spirit that was in the book of Acts is the same Holy Spirit that's in the book of LifePoint, that's in the book of our church, that's in the the lives of the believers today? The same God that was active then is the same God who's still active today. And I want us to come away from this great story, this great book, asking the Lord for the same thing. So I really have two thoughts, and the second one's divided up a lot, but the first one is the book of Acts is really a story about God. When we started this series, and for much of the series, we used to say the book of Acts is really the Acts of the Apostles, and honestly, that's an editorial name given to this book. Luke didn't write out, didn't start out saying, I've decided to write a book called Acts by Luke. Um, He starts his letter by saying, I've I've written a, a, a researched account of the beginning of this church of the way of Jesus. And then later editors called it the book, uh, they called it the book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles. And that's one way to see this great book. It is an historical narrative. Other parts of the Bible, we have prophecy, we have history, we have epistles, we have gospels. Uh, The the letters of the New Testament are instructive and corrective. But the, the book of Acts stands uniquely as a historical biography of the early church. And as we read through that, Uh, It's an historical accounting of what God did through his apostles, through leaders, through men and women, and and actually it's it's what God did through normal people like you and me. And and for some of us, we don't see the people in the Bible as normal. We see them as Bible characters or larger than life or super spiritual, and we think, well, they made the Bible because they must have had something really great going on in their spiritual life. But I don't think that's a great way to see those people at all. They're normal like you and me. They go to the bathroom every day. They put on their tunics. I don't know how you put your tunic on, but one leg at a time to get the tunic joke. Anyway, they have issues. They get sick. They fight with their spouse. I mean, they're normal people like us. What's incredible in the book of Acts is actually not the people. What's incredible in the book of Acts is God working through regular people. The story of the book of Acts is the story of God working through people like you and me, people like Peter. Peter is a guy that many of us, man, we've got a lot of opinions about, but Peter was best friend of Jesus in the gospels, and now he's a leader of the new church, but he was an insecure leader. He said a lot of dumb stuff. He made a lot of mistakes when he was close to Jesus. How many of you think if I was best friends with Jesus, I would have never had a a loss, or like I would have just been winning all the time, never said dumb stuff? That's not true, because if Peter would say dumb stuff next to Jesus, you better know we'd say dumb stuff next to Jesus. This is the guy who Jesus says, come out here and walk on water, and while he's walking, he stops believing in Jesus. I have a whole sermon that I wrote on Peter, like he's just one of us. He was a failed business guy when Jesus met him. He had a whole night of fishing with no fish. I don't know, if you're a fisherman, Fish is a big part of your product. You know what I'm saying? He, he had family issues. He said dumb things. He lost his confidence in Jesus. He wasn't always faithful to Jesus. He had racism issues in his heart. During the crucifixion, he got called out by a teenage girl, and he got punked out by her. 
But the story of Peter is not about Peter. It's what God can do with Peter. It's, it's a story of God using Peter in a mighty way to preach the first sermon recorded in the New Testament and thousands come to faith in Jesus. I mean, this guy didn't go to Bible college. He didn't go to seminary. He wasn't a trained orator. The first speech we ever see Peter give and thousands come to faith. I have a doctorate in preaching. Never had a crowd that big in, in my preaching. Yet. If I could just walk on water first, you know what I'm saying? God performed miracles through Peter. One miracle was so crazy, the shadows of his body fell on people as he walked by and his shadow healed them. The story of Peter is a story of God at work through Peter. He was just like us, but God used him mightily. Stephen was a guy who shows up kind of out of nowhere in Acts chapter six, but he was a guy who was available. We know nothing about his past, his character, his upbringing, his theological training. And when he comes on the scene, we see Stephen being useful for God and he was faithful to speak up for Jesus. He wouldn't, he, he preached the gospel. He didn't preach it in a way that I would. He, he laced the entirety of the old covenant into a masterful sermon in a way that I've never done it before. He was so useful to God that it actually cost him his life. Some people say, I can be useful for God as long as it benefits me, as long as it grows my, my influence or, or grows my portfolio or my brand. But P Stephen was willing to be useful for God all the way unto his death. When Stephen dies, they bury him up to his waist in the ground in front of the religious leaders, and they chuck rocks at his head until he dies. And filled with the word, filled with God's love, and filled by the Spirit, as they're stoning him, Stephen's last witness of God is he prays for the people stoning him to death. The story of Stephen's not a story of him, it's a story of God working through a normal guy. I don't know about you, but I need a whole lot of God in me to pray for the people who are persecuting me. And the story of Stephen is a story of God in the life of an ordinary guy that we knew nothing about, just willing to be used by God. Barnabas was a man who was just a nice guy. Some of you, I just... Some of you just brighten my day when I see you. You smile all the time. You're always warm and positive. You're like Barnabas. When there's two of you, you're Barnabai, plural. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I needed a giggle out of you for once. Barnabas was not a leader. He was a second chair guy. He had a gift to speaking life into folks, to encouraging them. There's some of you, I've stopped you in the hall, and I've said, you are such an encourager. And they go, you don't even know me. I go, yeah, I see your face every Sunday. Some of y'all have such encouraging faces when I preach. You're like this. The most discouraging face is this one. <laughs> I see you too. <laughs> Ma'am. Anyway, Barnabas just had a gift to encourage, to lift people up. He was a number two guy forever, never had the front seat, never was the Bible reader. He was the third string quarterback, never the upfront guy, not known for doing anything major except he was an encouragement to Paul and to others. He lifted the hands of Paul. He even had disagreements with other leaders, but God used Barnabas because the story of Barnabas is a story about God. Lydia was a, a leader in the church, and she was a, a wealthy lady. She was an entrepreneur, had a business. She had a big heart for generosity. She opened her home to others. She was a great host. She was blessed by God because she let God use her life to refresh others. When Paul and his crew comes through town, she says, you can have my whole house. Open the cabinets. You can have whatever you want. She was also a brand new Christian. The scripture tells us about Lydia that she had a, a heart for the God of the Jews, but she didn't know much about Jesus. She was new to Christ, and immediately she said, my life is not mine. God can have it. She was willing to let God use her, and Lydia's story as a female advanced the cause of the gospel in a major way, but the story of Lydia is not a story about Lydia. It's a story about God using a person like Lydia. Even the Apostle Paul is a huge story of how God can change someone else, how God can use a life of a person willing to be used by God. Paul was a terrible person. You ever have people in your life that are just awful, but then we say things like this, but he's got a good heart. God knows her heart. Here's what the Bible says, your heart's wicked. Paul exemplified that. He did not have a good heart. He wasn't a good guy. He was a total dirtbag. He was a horrible person, and he was a horrible person under the guise of religion. He was a murderer. He was a hunter of Christians. He was cocky and arrogant, full of religious theology and doctrines, but no heart for God or people. And then the Lord got a hold of his life. 
And God did miracles through Paul. He raised the dead kid from pre, he preached so long. A kid fell out of the window and died and Paul said, raise him up. Paul made a lot of mistakes. When he started preaching, he petrified other believers. They go, we don't trust you, man, you're gonna kill us. He had harsh things to say. He fought with Peter to his face. He fought with Barnabas, the encourager, because Barnabas was gracious and forgiving towards John Mark. Paul was like, I don't want anything else to do with you. I'm, in Jesus' name, I'm going to preach. Paul had issues. He wasn't always a good friend to church leaders. But Paul's story was about a good and powerful and gracious, holy God who can use a normal man's man dude with a temper problem like Paul if he'd make himself available. The book of Acts is not about the acts of the apostles. The book of Acts is actually the acts of God through people like you and me. We serve the same God. We live for the same big purpose. The only difference I can tell between the characters and the personalities in the book of Acts and you and me is really simple. It's availability and anointing. The difference in their lives and our lives. Them being used mightily for God. Listen, Paul didn't start out going, I'm gonna be a world famous evangelist and preacher and I'm gonna be so good, I'm gonna end up in the Bible. Paul became that guy because he was available and he was anointed. The question I have for you is, are you available to God and are you willing to let him anoint you? Listen, you provide the availability and God will provide his anointing. I believe with all my heart, God's not looking for scholars or theologically right people. He's not looking for people that have got perfect church attendance or great giving records. God is looking for people who say, Lord, use me. That's the simple qualifier of God breathing on a person. And listen, the anointing of God is not mystical or crazy. Like when we think of the anointing of God, it's, it's, it's having the breath of God's presence and giftings and power on your life. And there's nothing more that we should desire than to live a life breathed upon by God himself. In fact, the theology of the Holy Spirit on us, the Spirit of God in the Old Covenant is called the Ruach of God, the breath of God. And I believe with all my heart, I'm strictly convinced, God will anoint you if you will make yourself available to him. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have been here a long time. Lydia was a baby believer. She just said, God, my business is yours. My life is yours. My home is yours. Every part of me is yours. I don't know about you, but I just, I want for our church to be a people that God says, I can use them. They don't have it all figured out yet. Paul didn't. Peter didn't. That guy 10 chapters in had to have God, listen to this, with Peter. Jesus had to come back from heaven to deal with Peter's racism. Y'all remember that? Peter was showing preferential treatment to the Jews over the Gentiles. It's called racism. I don't know if y'all knew this, but racism is evil. Only like seven of you agree with that? That's a problem. I don't know if you knew this or not, this is a repeat. Racism is evil, but the apostle Peter church planting pastor had racism in his heart. And God, the son, Jesus Christ, literally comes out of heaven to give him a vision to tell Peter that everybody under Christ is clean and loved by God. Hey church, can you imagine Jesus like kicking it in heaven, relaxing after the resurrection? Telling the father, like, oh, man, that was terrible. Them thorns were real, bro. Like, dad, you know, whatever. I don't know how they talk. And then he looks down at one of his generals, and he looks into his heart, and he sees deference and preference and racism. And Jesus probably kicked back on his throne at the right hand. The father's like, dang it, I got to go back. I'll be right back. <sighs> Peter. <laughs> and, and Peter, when it happens, begins that debate with an argument. How are you gonna argue with the returned Jesus? I just want you to be encouraged, listen to me. You don't have to have it all right yet, just be available. Just be available to God. The big picture of the story of the book of Acts is a people who said, God, you can have me. You can have my brokenness, my wounds, you can have my bank account, you can have my house. You can have my speaking gifts, you can have my encouragement gifts, you can have my gender, you can have my life, you can have my, my, my singleness. Paul would write later, he goes, I stayed single to do more for God. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter seven. The book of Acts is not about them, it's about God. And let me just say it to you. 
If you will say to God, I'm available. You can use me. I belong to you. However you want me, God, I'm all in. I love this phrase. My life is in your hands. How many of y'all remember that song? You don't have to worry. But don't you be afraid. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> My life is in your hands. God, I am your currency. Spend me at your pleasure. Some of us say, Lord can have this part, this part, this part, not that part. Because that's the part I like the most. I want to encourage you, church. Go all in with Jesus. You provide the availability and watch the Lord provide the anointing. There's something so powerful about the wind of God. Clint Brown had this song. Breathe on me, breathe on me, Holy Ghost power. That's how he sounded. Breathe on me, oh, yesterday's gone. Y'all remember this? <laughs> but today I'm in need. <laughs> I don't have a keyboard player or nothing up here. I'm just... Bam, bam, bam. Holy Ghost power, breathe on me. That's what we need. Oh, rain on me. All right, stop it. <laughs> God, breathe on me. Touch my life. Look, man, this, when you are living with the breath of God, sin isn't appealing. Greed isn't appealing. The things of this world just don't have the same appeal. And notice in the book of Acts, God used working people, single people, divorced people, entrepreneurial people, older people like Priscilla and Aquila who discipled Apollos. The book of Acts is a story of God moving in and through people like us. Will you and I be a people who say, Lord, breathe on me. You can have me however you want. My hands, heart, mouth, job, bank account, talent, family, career, future. Lord, I'm yours to be used at your pleasure. Stephen was willing to be used by God until the very last breath he breathed. The story of Acts is not about the people. It's about God, anointing available people. The second thing is, and this is really where I'm going to kind of park for the rest of our message here. The book of Acts is how God builds his church. And it's how he's still building his church. It's through people It's by the Spirit, and he's still doing it. How many of you know the same God who built the church in Acts 1 through 28 is the same God building his church here? I want to spend the last bit of our time thinking through an overview of how God builds it. I was actually going to title the message, When God Builds a Church, but I decided to focus on big ideas instead. But I want you to understand first was that the book of Acts is an amazing book about God, how God the Holy Spirit has come to be with us forever, and he lives in us, he empowers us, he equips us, he dwells in us. Let me just remind all of you You're not a Christian without the Holy Spirit. You're not saved without the Holy Spirit. You go, I believe in Jesus, but keep that Holy Ghost away from me. That's not an option. God the Father loves you. God the Son saves you. God the Spirit fills you. There is no way around it. That's the way it is for the Christian. We serve a Godhead that is three in one, and the Father has a heart for you. The Son gave his life for you, and the Spirit has to dwell in you. Get used to it, embrace it, desire it, seek it, ask for it, give yourself to the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let the Lord use you with total availability and abandon. But God has a plan. Here's the big picture of God's plan. You ready? God created everything, and his highlight of creation was humanity. The highlight of his creation, the only part of his creation that he gave commands to, that he put his spirit and his likeness and image into was mankind, and we blew it. We fell into sin. And sin has separated mankind from God. God, by his mercy, gives us his law to direct us back to him. But the law was imperfect to change a heart. So God, the son, chose to evacuate himself from heaven and come to earth. He incarnated himself into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. Comes humbly as a baby in a borrowed stable to a single mom. He came to live. He came to die And he came to resurrect. And let me tell you something. He ain't doing that again. There's no plan B. There's no repeat. There's no sequel to this. He came once to live, once to die for the sins of the world and to resurrect for all of us. And he chose to give his life for a ransom for us and to repair that relationship between sinful man and a holy God. And then the book of Acts shows us that the after action of God, after Jesus, was the Holy Spirit. 
The book of Acts starts with Jesus promising that the Holy Spirit would come and he would dwell in us and he would live in us and he would change us forever. And not only does he indwell us as believers, but he will use us to build the greatest organization the world's ever known. Greater than any nation, company, or family, the church is the greatest organization the world has ever known. It spans every generation, it crosses every cultural boundary, it's male, female, slave free, Jew, Greek, old, young, black, white, brown, it's across the entire globe. The only organization that is as ecumenical as this, it's the only one is the church. There's nothing else like it in the world. And it's the reason Christ came, and it's the reason the Spirit came, was to build this family called the body of Christ, so that we may reach the rest of the world. God, his Holy Spirit, has moved in to help us, to empower us, to enable us, to encourage us, to provoke us to build his church. How many of you know the same God who changed us is wanting us to help change others, to reach people far from God, to disciple people who need to know God to be the church? And he does it, I give you these five thoughts of how he's doing it, how he builds his church. God is building his church with an assignment, with a mission, Many of you in the military understand being mission-centered and mission-focused. Every one of your companies and organizations need to have a mission statement. Our church has a mission statement. God does nothing by accident. Do you think God ever stumbles across something? It was like, oh, wow, wow, look at that. I built Mount Everest. Uh, whoops. God does everything on purpose with order by design. He is the creative creator of everything, and it all exists with incredible order and beauty. The Lord is building his church with order and beauty and purpose and messy people like you and me, but he has a mission. And he starts in Acts 1-8 by saying it like this. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. How many of you know the power to live for God is because the power of God is in you? Don't try to do it in your own strength. Do it in the strength of the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and watch, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem for them was hometown. Judea and Samaria is their country, their nation. The ends of the earth is the rest of the world. Jesus establishes a mission for the church. It's empowered by the Holy Spirit. It includes us as witnesses and it has geography. It starts in your home, in your city, in your neighborhood, in your town. It expands to the nation. It ultimately goes to the ends of the world. God's plan from the beginning of the human experience is that we would be God's witness to everyone. Some of us say, well, I wish Jesus would show up and fix my office. And Jesus would say, you're there. I wish God would show up and fix my family. And God goes, yeah, that's why I put you there. I can't stand my family. That's why I put you there. I can't see them either. They, you know, I'm just, God doesn't say that. He loves them. That we would be empowered by God, the Holy Spirit, to be his witnesses. Now, we would literally lay down our lives to make a big deal of Christ. When I say witness, many of us think of that in the English. We think of it like being a witness in a courtroom. You know, I give a testimony of what I saw, but the word in the Greek is the same word we have for martyr. Jesus is saying that you would be a martyr for me, not only possibly literally, but definitely figuratively, that we would regularly lay down our lives to make a big deal about Jesus, that we would live dead to ourselves to make much of Jesus Christ. That's what he says. You, the spirit will come upon you. You'll lay down your lives to make much of me. It'll start home. It'll go to the nation. It'll go to the world. God is on assignment. Listen, I want you to hear this, the heart of God. God is on assignment to reach everyone on the planet with the gospel. And listen, UNICEF, the UN, Red Cross, governments, Republicans or Democrats, none of those groups have this assignment. Only the church, only us, the body of Christ has this assignment from God. He will do it through the church, full of the spirit, full of his power. Second, God's building his church with a mission God is building his church by the power of the Holy Spirit. King Solomon wrote it like this in Psalm 127, verse one. He said, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. I wanna tell you something. I'm so desperate that the Holy Spirit is on this house, that the Holy Spirit is in this church. Listen, if all we're doing is religious routine and God's not changing lives, I need to go find another job. Y'all need to find another church. 
I'm reading a book by R.T. Kendall called Anointing, and he, he gives this really gloomy analysis of the church in America. He said, if the Holy Spirit left the church in America, 90% of them would still show up next Sunday and do the religious routine that they did last week. Unless the Spirit breathes on this thing, I don't wanna have anything to do with it. How many of you would say, God changed my life since being a part of Life One Church? If that's you, can you say amen or wave at me? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's not me, are you kidding? That's not the dream team, are you joking? We're just a part of this thing. But it's the Holy Spirit at work and we've invited and we've coveted and we've asked God for his presence and we've said, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you build the lives of people and change people forever? He must be the center of his church. Over and over again, we see in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit showed up. When they got arrested, they prayed and the Spirit got them out of jail. Every time somebody took credit for what God was doing, it cost them. Ananias and Sapphira tried to take credit and they lost their lives. Simon the sorcerer tried to take credit and he lost. Others tried to take credit for what God was doing and it cost them dearly. But when God's at the center of building his church, you will receive power. Look what happened in Acts 2, 4. The believers were gathered in prayer and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They weren't filled with more information. They weren't filled with more theology. Some of us only come to church to get the next lesson. Stop coming to church for that. Come to church to be transformed by the power of God through the preached word, through the gathering of the church, through the worship of the saints. They weren't filled with theology, they were filled with the spirit. In Acts four, in Acts five, in Acts six, being full of the Holy Ghost and with prayer as a marker of a power-filled church, God grew it like crazy. Peter preached and did miracles under the power of the Holy Spirit. Stephen was able to preach until his dying breath under the power of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine someone stoning you to death and praying for them only by the power of God? Paul was constantly under the anointing and the power of God. It's part of how Paul never got discouraged. I don't know about you, but my third arrest, I'm out. My fourth beating, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, he said, I was beaten countless times. How do you lose count? Is it 17? Eh, you know, I just quit the tally marks after 17. Listen, unless God is in our midst, unless the Holy Spirit is building Life Point Church, we are gathering as a crowd on Sundays, and it should bore you and repel you. We must desire to be on mission with God and full of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Listen, you don't have to be weird to be full of the Spirit. You just gotta be available for God's anointing on your life. Seek the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit, be baptized in the Holy Spirit. God is building the church through the Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen from the church, everybody? Third, some of y'all are like so scared of the Holy Spirit, you need to just get on over that. Just get over it. Some of you are like, I know God loves me and I know Jesus saved me, but that Holy Ghost, that's for that other church over there. You're not saved without the Holy Spirit. You might as well release yourself to him and watch what God will do. I've loved as your pastor, I've loved watching people just be yielded to the Holy Spirit and then the Holy Spirit just rock your world. And then you go, I can't believe what God did in my life. I yield to the Holy Spirit on giving. I start tithing and then the Lord gives me promotions and I get out of debt and it's like, yep, breathe. God breathes on it. I said yes to serving in Kid Point, and then all of a sudden, man, God opened up all these opportunities for me. I said yes to serve on served. I said yes to obeying God. I said yes, I'm available, and then the anointing of God shows up. That's the Holy Spirit. Third is that God's church is a community of ordinary, devoted Christians. This is what we see in the book of Acts. I said it somewhat earlier, but I remember God builds his church with normal people, broken people, successful people, single Moms, 50-year married couples, college students, young adults, high school kids, young people, burnt out people, holy rollers, people from every background, black and white, brown, Asian, old, young, male and female, who look to Jesus, our Savior. That's what we have in common. We look to Jesus, our Savior, our Master, our Lord. Paul write, or Luke writes in Acts 2 that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. It doesn't say like it was some homogenous group of all the same skin tone and gender and demography. They just collectively, like they were all together. Look at what it says. It says awe, wonder came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs are being done through the apostles. Look at this. And all who believed had everything. They were together and they had all things in common. It's not about you. 
It's not about me. We're an eclectic bunch of people. Have you ever met people at church that go to your church out in town and you're like, they go to another service, right? And you find out somehow you're at church together. They're like, I go to Life Point. You're like, what? I go to Life Point. It's because God blends a whole group of people who otherwise the culture would never fit us together. Think about this. Culture would never fit us all together. But under Christ, we're a community, we're a family. And we're no, like, it's not about you and me. It's about Jesus who's the center of it all. Can I hear an amen? Two more and then I'm done. God will empower us for high times and hard times. And we're walking a family through right now. It's part of our church for a number of years. They're through a very hard time right now, the death of a teenage son. I'm sharing with other friends who their businesses are doing great. Their family's doing awesome. They're in high times. The whole book of Acts is this constant tension between good and bad because we live in a painful world and a broken culture but we got a good God in a painful world. We got high times and low times, painful seasons and powerful seasons. And God would heal a bunch of people through Peter just for him to get arrested and beaten for blasphemy. God would use Paul to preach on top to the social class of the top of the social class, only to be then held in prison for three years and carried away on a slave ship and shipwrecked in Malta and bitten by a snake just for preaching the gospel. It would be God who's the constant source of encouragement and power. You notice they don't get discouraged, they don't back off because they were available and full of the Spirit. And here's what I want you to understand. You may be going through something really hard right now, but don't you ever forget that God is with you in the middle of it. If he's allowing you to go through it, he's inviting himself to go through it with you. He will never leave you. Hey, on the other side, if you're succeeding right now and all you do is win, 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 no matter what, you better give God all the credit and the glory and the honor because he can quickly take that back from you. Don't you forget the same God who was with you in the valley is the God on the mountaintop. And that's what we see in the book of Acts is a God who's consistent. Paul writes in Acts 20, he says, I don't account my life of any value or precious. Everything about me, the highs and the lows is nothing. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus. The only thing that mattered to Paul was not highs and lows, good times and hard times. The only thing that matters was finishing what God had called him to do. I wanna invite you to that same finish line. Finally, I want you to see that God is building his church so that the world will be changed. Go back to the mission of God in Acts 1.8. You'll receive power to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. What is the purpose of why God is building his church? To change the world. Come on, everybody say world changers. I pray over your children. I pray over you that you'd be world changers. The mission of God is what motivates the church. The mission of God is the mission of our church. We say it like this. The only reason LifePoint Church exists, the only reason is to lead people to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. Listen to what I say. The only reason we're a church is not to build my brand or influence, not to put my face on some more billboards. It's not about Mike. It's not about you. It's not about photos of your kids. The only reason we're here is to lead people to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. We're not here for programming. We're not here to be big. We're here to lead people to be fully devoted. That's the mission of God for the church. It's why Jesus came. It's why the Holy Spirit came. It's why Peter preached all the time. It's why Philip jumped into that chariot with an Ethiopian eunuch. It's why Stephen died. It's why James led the church. It's why Paul got saved. It's why Aquila and Priscilla taught. It's why Apollos planted churches. It's why Lydia hosted Paul and his companions. It's why the jailer got converted. It's why the believers sold all their possessions and gave to one another. It's why God kept showing up in the lives of the believers in the book of Acts because they existed simply to lead people to be devoted followers of Jesus. It's why we will show up every weekend. It's why we host and lead small groups. It's why we go through discipline and correction. It's why we're held accountable to sin. It's why we sing any song. It's why we will host eight Easter services. It's why we'll launch a website and give it away for others to fill up Easter. It's why you will serve in eight Easter services. It's why our youth pastor comes to work. It's why our small groups pastor comes to work. It's why I moved to this town. It's why you come to this church. It's why we set up and tear down at Austin P and feed college kids every week, simply to lead people to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. By the wind of the spirit, we have decided, God, you can use me. You build your church through me, with me, in me. And we did it at Rossview. We're doing it at Austin P. God willing, next year, we'll be opening our tiny town campus because we wanna build a church that changes the world. 
So Lord God, would you use us? Lord, may it be in us as it was in the book of Acts. Lord, would you transform us and change us and use us and empower us and equip us to the glory of God. God, I pray for this this church full of normal people that have issues, highs and lows. They're winning and struggling, God, in every part of life. I thank you, Lord, that we would be a group of people who say, Lord, no matter what I bring to the table, I bring it all to you. Can you open your hands to the Lord? In fact, could you, to, could you make a physical shift in your posture, whether you lean forward, whether you stand to your feet? I want you to confess to God today, Lord, I am available and I am ready to receive your anointing. Come on, respond to this message and respond and say, God, as it was in the book of Acts, let it be inside of me, let it be through me. And Lord, we stand before you today, Lord God, with a posture of readiness and willingness. And we say, God, I'm all in. I'm your vessel to be used to the glory of God. Come on, if that's your confession today, lean forward, get on your feet, give your life to Jesus today and say, God, I'm all yours. I'm available, I'm willing. My hands, my heart, my money, my mouth, my gifts, my talents, my baggage, my pain, every part of me, Lord God, is available to you. And Lord, would you breathe on my life? Would you anoint my life? Would you anoint us, Lord God, to be useful to the master in Jesus' name? I thank you, Lord God, for moving on your church. Guys, I can't pray this for you. You gotta pray it and mean it to the Lord. Say, God, I'm all in. I'm all yours. I belong to you. You can have all of me, the private parts, the public parts. You can have the business side of me, the home side of me. You can have all of my life. I'm all in to the glory of God. Lord, we thank you for using this church to change our city, to change the world, to make a difference in the lives of people, to lead people to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. Lord, may it be as it was in the book of Acts. Breathe on us, encourage us, equip us, empower us, gift us with your Holy Spirit, and we'll receive it by faith believing you for it, God, to change us forever in Jesus' name. And everybody pray this with me. If you've not confessed Christ as Lord of your life, that has to be the first step. I do this every day. You need to do it all the time as well. But this is for those that really need to make this step and say, I'm in. Come on, everybody pray with me. Say, God, I believe in Jesus, that he died for me because you love me. He raised from the dead because you love me. You sent your Holy Spirit because you love me. Say, I receive your gift of salvation. I receive your forgiveness for my sin. I'm yours, I'm all in, and I will live for you for the rest of my life. To God be the glory. Come on, let's celebrate in Jesus' name. Amen, everybody.